Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to come into your presence and worship you and praise you. God, we thank you that we uh, just truly have a, a hungry bunch here this morning that want to hear from you. God, we believe that we can come into your presence, that you're a very real, living, true God. The one true God who can speak to us and deliver our hearts that we walk out this place, not the same. In one message, God, there's so much power and authority in your word that one message can change our lives. So, Father, we're asking this morning that we come in this place to have an ear to hear from you and an eye to see from your word exactly what you would have for us. And, God, that our hearts would be made to be hungry for you. Folks, I'm asking that you would ask God this morning, God, speak to me today. God, I'm here I'm asking, God, that you speak to me. I have an ear to hear from you today. God, give me an eye to see what I need to see in my life today. And God, I'll respond to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, turn to two places, Acts 2 and Luke 24. Turn to Luke 24 first, put a marker in Luke 24, and then flip over to Acts 2, and we will start, uh, start in Acts 2. As you're turning, I'm going to read from Matthew 28. Gang, what would it be like if this whole resurrection thing was just a fairy tale? What would it be like if the tomb was open, the ground never shook, the guards stood there till day four? What would it be like? Let me just, I just want to read this, Matthew 28, to you. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to draw toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. They, they, listen, these guards were like beastie, centurion, soldier, manly, huge, don't mess with me guards. The angels showed up and they just fell to the ground and fainted like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified, for he is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, come see the place where he was laying. What would happen, folks? Where would we be if the stone was not rolled away? Where would we be if the, if the ground never shook? Where would we be if the women showed up and it was the guards were just standing tall and standing firm? And they stood there till the fourth day. No angel, no resurrection. Well, Paul tells us exactly where we would be. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and there's been some thoughts coming up that the resurrection wasn't real. And he made it very clear. You know what? He said this in 1 Corinthians 15. If the resurrection isn't real, if God and, and Christ did not raise from the dead, then our preaching is foolish. Our faith is foolish. Our belief, worthless, he says. And he said, among everybody, we are be most pitied. In other words, if we believed this and it didn't happen, we should be the most to get laughed at. That's a serious, serious thought. But we know that when Jesus was resurrected, we know that the Bible is accurate based on fact and evidence that after his resurrection, we knew there is there's one named Jesus Christ who, who said and made statements that he was the son of God, that he was the king of the Jews, that he was one who died on a cross, slain and just shredded physically, spear up through his side, and he breathed out his lap. And we know that this one came to a place of death. Buried in a tomb. And then three days later, we know that they saw the tomb. It was empty. Angel made declaration that he was alive. And for 40 days after that third day, Jesus walked on the earth as a resurrected king. Jesus showed himself to over 500 people and then some in 40 days to prove I am who I said I am. And we're going to look at this this morning and recognize 
What are three areas that death could not hold Jesus? And what proved that death could not hold Jesus? The three are this. Number one, that he was divine in his power over death. And he was divine over his divine promises over death. And his divine purpose over death. His power, his promises, and his purpose. We're going to see that this morning, gang. Man, do you understand that we have put all of our eggs in one basket? Do you understand that every single person who has breath has to put all their eggs in one basket? That Jesus Christ is who He said He is. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That Jesus Christ did die on the cross as a sacrifice for us. And that Jesus Christ did raise from the dead and is alive right now at the right hand of power of Almighty God. And there will be a day that He returns for the church. All our eggs are in one basket. The resurrection isn't true. The Bible says that we're a bunch of fools. But we know by fact, we know by history, we know by absolute truth, our faith in this word, that Jesus Christ, the one who did hang on that cross for 40 days, walked the earth and showed himself to hundreds and hundreds of people as being alive and resurrected exactly as he said he would. Man, let's look at this. Come on, Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 23 says this. This man, meaning Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. First of all, you've got to see this whole weekend, this whole thing, cross, burial, death, resurrection, was a God-ordained plan before he even made Adam and Eve, before he even made mankind. God already had a predetermined and knowing foreknowledge plan that he would have to send his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty of the sin of man, which he hasn't even created yet. What? What? So you're telling me that God knew that he would make created man to be in fellowship in, with him, to walk in relationship with him, to praise and honor him, and to bring him glory. That's the purpose that he created man. And he knew that man would sin and man would separate themselves from God. A, a word called death, which means to be separate from a holy God. And he knew this was going to take place. And he knew that he was going to have to send Jesus Christ, his son, to fix the sin issue. He knew this. Yes. Why would he do that? Because God so loved the world. Because God has loved you with an everlasting love. It's a love, folks, that I have a difficult time wrapping my mind around. How much God could love me when I read a simple verse like this, that it was predetermined and foreknowledge plan of God, that you've got to know that the cross, death, burial, resurrection, that was not a work of man. Jesus says in John 10, 18, that listen, no one takes my life. I lay my life down. It is of my own initiative. Just because you're the one putting the nails in my hands, that doesn't mean this is on you. God predetermined this plan to send His Son to die on the cross, and Jesus made it clear, we're in charge here. Not man. Gang, that's amazing to know that God in His Son, Jesus Christ, said, I'm in charge. And even, even Pilate at one point says, man, do you know the authority I have? And then Jesus pipes right up, you have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you by my Father. I mean, I love that. I'm like... Come on, punch him or something. This is like great, right? I mean, come on. I mean, over and over and over in this truth, we see this is a work of God for people that he loves. And this is not a work of man. And then he goes into this and he says this, verse 24, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Gang, again, death, it, it, this is the word thanatos. It means to be separate from God for eternity. That's what death is. Death isn't, I breathe my last, I go in the ground, and that's it. Every single person who has life will go to one place or the other. There is heaven and there is hell. There is God and there is Satan. There are sheep and there are goats, man. That is the absolute clear common sense. This is the real deal of what it really means 
really means in death. All of us have an eternity. One will be with God in heaven for all eternity. The other will be separate from God. And the Bible declares that part to be death. And through Jesus Christ and through the resurrection, God says he no longer has agony over death. This is great. Now look at this. Since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Death could not hold him. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus. Incredible. And you see where he has such power and he has such authority over death. And when you understand and recognize for the wages of sin is death, when you understand what that means, that we deserve to be separate from God eternity, that there is a very real enemy in Satan and an adversary who had, had the rights to death. This is huge. You've got to see this. Satan had the rights to death. He had the rights that we would spend an eternity with him in the absence of God based on our sin. And the best news is this. All our eggs in one basket, folks. That Jesus put an end to that agony because death could not hold him. It's incredible. Listen, Hebrews 2 says this. You've got to see this. This is amazing. Therefore, since the children share in the flesh and the blood, and he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death. That is Satan. That is the enemy. That Jesus Christ, by death, took the authority of death back and rendered Satan powerless over death. There is such authority and there is such power in his resurrection that he took the rights that we would no longer need the agony of death. Took it right from the devil. Now look at this. He might free those that th who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. You ever met somebody who's so in fear of death that they are just held in captivity and they are held slavery to themselves, their own little prison inside because they are in such fear of dying and not the unknown. And yet, folks, as the church, as those who have been bought back, those who have been redeemed, those who understand the victory of the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, those who understand the power and authority when Jesus was raised from the dead, that He took the agony of that death, that we no longer, as the church, ever have to fear death. To know that absent from the body is to be home with the Lord. To know, as Paul said, man, I would love to stay here and preach, and I think that's important, but my heart is to go home because I'm not even a citizen of this. My citizen belongs in heaven. Now, man, when you have that grip, when you have that deep understanding of Christ's power and authority over death and the victory of the resurrection, we should have no fear of taking our last breath here, knowing that we no longer will ever be separate from a holy God because of what Jesus did for us. See, if Jesus would have never come out of that grave, we'd still be held in the power of death by the enemy. It's amazing, amazing victory to know that his divine power was shown over the victory of death. Come on, number two is this, his divine promises. And I want you to see this. I want you to see so many times where Jesus declared the victory. So many times to, to his Jewish folks and to his disciples and to the, to the scribes and Pharisees and to the chief priests, he declared, I am going to die, but yet on the third day I will raise again. He said this over and over and over. John 2 says this. I want you to see this. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show, show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. And he's saying, listen, you will kill me, but in three days I will show you my authority. I will show you my power over death because I'm giving you a promise, a divine promise that after you kill me three days later, you'll see me again in the flesh, alive. I mean, who can make that statement? I mean, that's a pretty significant problem. You know, to be honest, if, if somebody came up to me and said, you know what, uh, Someday, you know, soon I'm going to die, but man, I'm going to be raised from the dead in three days. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to come knocking. I'm thinking, you're a nut job, dude. What are you talking about? You get, dude, get your head on right. That's the claim of one. 
could imagine these guys are going, hmm. Matthew 16, 21 says this. It's incredible. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples. Listen, he, he didn't leave anything up for question for his disciples. This is what's so amazing about this. He didn't hold secrets for, to his disciples. He didn't let, make them just, well, you guys, I'm just going to do some things. You're going to have to figure it out for yourself. He, man, he laid the plan out there. He made it crystal clear what was going to take place. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and be raised up on the third day. I mean, you'd imagine, gang, that after the miracles and after the time that they spent with Jesus in the boat and he speaks to the storm, blind eyes are coming back. I mean, legs are growing back. Leprosy is being healed. Casting out demons from those who are possessed. I mean, he, they saw the absolute divine work of Christ in powerful, amazing ways like no one has ever done before. Taught like no one has ever taught before. You would think that when he spoke something like this, they would remember it. Again, Matthew 20 says this. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be, will be delivered, that means betrayed, to the chief priests, the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock him, scourge him, and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. So wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that when he was betrayed, Hand it over to the, the, the scribes, hand it over to the chief priests. They began to mock him. They began to beat him. They began to whip him. You would think maybe this would come to mind. Oh man, it's just as he said it was. And when he's hanging on a cross, crown of thorns on his head, crucified, you would think, man, this is just as he said it was. And then when he breathed his last, you would think. And he made a divine promise. He told us that this was going to happen. How is it that we don't trust him in this after all that we've seen, after all that we've experienced, after we've seen this man do nothing, do things that no one has ever done before. He is taught like no one has ever taught. We have declared from our own mouths that yes, he is the son of God. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. We have seen things. This is our belief. You would think that when he breathed his last, that they would have the hope to know that in three days, Jesus is going to return. But you know, something amazing happened. When he breathed his last, the disciples lost hope. Jerusalem lost hope. Israel lost hope. They must have missed the divine promise that on the third day I will rise again. On the third day I will rise again. You take this temple, you bury it, but on the third day it will be alive. Somewhere they missed that. Let's look at this in Luke 24. Because we see a very true story. Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb. The tomb is open. The angels are there in just an absolute amazing, incredible, wild scene, really. Or the, isn't it awesome that the, the earth shakes, the angels appear, move the stone, and he sits right on top of the stone like, ha! I know you're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He has risen, and then what's he say? Just as he said he would. Ding, 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 you would think, right? So, man, they run back. And they declare to the disciples, he is alive, the tomb, the angels, they go into this whole scene. And you know what the Bible says the disciples' first response was? Oh, that's nonsense. After all that you've seen, this is the disciples, man. These are the ones who walked with Jesus, saw the miracles, did miracles themselves. And their declaration after all that they've seen in Jesus, that's nonsense. What? And you see a hopelessness set in. And you see 
grief set in and you see sorrow set in. You see, you see this thing begin to play out like that's not the way we thought it was going to go. That's not the plan that I had. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Even though Jesus told them, I will be betrayed, I will be handed over, I will be mocked, I will be beaten, I will be crucified. How could they think it's not supposed to be this way? Now look at this. So you see this sense, and this is the third day. I want you to see this. All this was taking place in Jerusalem. Verse 13, Behold, two of them, that's the disciples, were going that very day, that's the third day, to the village of Emus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. Here these disciples were in Jerusalem and they were waiting and they are going through this whole weekend of crazy. And now they hang their heads in sadness. And they left their hope in Jerusalem and they begin to walk back. Well, it wasn't like we thought. Now look at what they say. This is amazing. They start walking, verse 14, and they were talking with each other about all the things which had taken place. And while they were talking, this is after the resurrection. Jesus has always been resurrected. This is the third day, man. The grave is empty. He's already out of the grave. They know that the grave is empty. This is the kicker. They know the grave is empty. They've already talked to the women about the angel. This is amazing. And here, they hang their heads in a they're already hearing a report of what took place. That can't be. Nonsense, they say. So they leave all of their hopes in Jerusalem and hang their head in sadness and begin to walk, begin to talk. I could imagine. Did you see him on the cross? Did you see them pounding those nails in his hands and his feet? Did you see the anger and the hatred? Did you see, you remember those people yelling out, crucify him, crucify him. Do you, can you imagine what just took place this weekend? What just happened to us? He was our leader. He was the one that we put all our, our eggs in that basket of that one named Jesus. He was supposed to take the throne. Did you see him cry out from the cross? Man, I was hoping he's going to come off the cross and just, I thought, I thought that it would be different. And then he lowered his head and he's dead. I could imagine that conversation because they were discussing what took place this weekend. And then look at this. This is great. Verse 15, and while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began to travel with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, I mean, this is amazing. Jesus shows up and says, what are you guys talking about? And then he says this, he's like, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which had happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? I mean, this guy is like, what is wrong with you, dude? Are you the only one that hasn't got a clue of what just took place this week? Like, where have you been? How are you asking us what we're talking about when we are so sad? Where have you been? How do you, you're the only one in this area that doesn't got a clue of what just took place this weekend. It was a crazy, crazy weekend. And you don't know anything about it? Who are they talking to? Jesus. We're going to get into why well, I believe their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Folks, they lost their hope. They came to a place of sorrow and grief because it didn't work out the way they thought it would. And they were leaving their hope in Jerusalem and they're on this journey back home, a seven mile journey. Now get this, this is amazing. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene. I'm sure Jesus is just like, really? I mean, hello. And look what they recognize about Jesus. He was a prophet. He was mighty indeed in word and sight of God and, and all men. He was unbelievable, this Jesus of the Nazarene. Man, he was incredible. He was mighty like we've never seen before. 
And everybody knew about Jesus. I'm like, how do you not know? And look at this. And how the chief priest and the rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now this is amazing. Verse 21. And they're going into this. And I, man, I believe their mindset is this wasn't the way it was supposed to be because they say this. But we were hoping. We were hoping. Gang, that is a hope that is lost. We had a plan, and this was our plan, that it was going to be Him who was going to redeem Israel. We really had a hope, man. We really believed in the works that we saw in Him. We saw the authority. We saw how He spoke. Man, it was really our hope that He really was going to be that Messiah, the one who was going to come and redeem Israel. That was our hope. This is amazing. Indeed, besides all of this, it is the third day. What? Besides how great he was and mighty he was and powerful he was, and even regardless of our hope that it was going to be him. You know, it's the third day, and there's no sign of him. And then I think they say one of the dumbest things. And Jesus comments on how dumb it is actually. Because they say this. Again, folks, Jesus spoke over and over and over. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to hang on a tree and I'm going to die. But on the third day, I will rise. He said this again and again. You'd think they get this. And then this is amazing. And then he says this. Verse 22, but also some women among us, they amazed us. I mean, they even say this. They, she amazed us when they went to the tomb early the morning. That's this morning. This, this is just a little bit later, gang. You got to see, it's the same day. And did not find his body. And they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And then some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it exactly as a woman had said. But him they did not see. You know, we just can't figure this thing out. I'm like, what? Jesus said on the third day he would rise. And man, there was a whole group of them that went to the tomb. And it was empty. You know, clue one, right? Ding, ding, ding. Like, maybe that's a sign, people. Oh, and then they told us that the angels were there and they were brilliantly white. They were like lightning. Man, the guards, they fainted. They were just laying out over there. And, and the, even the angel sitting on top of the big tombstone said he has risen just as he said he would. Dad, that's what, that's what the angel told them. And then, man, part of our group went down and they checked it out. It was exactly as they said it was. But we just don't know what happened. <laughs> what? It's true. And I love what Jesus says. Look at this. Verse 25. You would think, and then Jesus says to them, Oh, foolish men, slow in heart to believe. Folks, why is it at times that we are so slow in heart to believe that there is a God who loved us with such a love that he would send his only son? Why is it that at times we are so slow in heart to believe that because of our sin, man, we are separate from God for an eternity, but God fixed that problem with a solution of Jesus Christ that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes on Him will never perish, will never see death, but will have eternal life. Why is it that we are so slow in heart to actually give our lives to Christ and believe that Jesus died for me? I rightfully deserve death because I know that I have done wrong. And I know because God is a holy, perfect, pure God, there's no way that I'm welcome into His presence because of my wrongdoing and my sin. Had it not been for Jesus who took that sin for me, that now He made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus took the sin for me on that cross as a sacrifice so that I can now stand before God righteous, pure, and holy because of what Jesus did for me. 
Why is it that we're so slow in heart to actually trust that and believe that? When the Bible truth is very clear. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. Can I guarantee you this is a, a one-way road? And it leads only through Jesus. That's it. Why are we so slow in heart to believe as we just can't come to a place to walk in faith in that? We just can't come to a place to actually believe that? Or we actually, some may actually think, well, I'm just not, I'm just not that bad of a person. I'm really not that big of a sinner. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Your matter of good and bad has no stakes in this. The Bible declares we all stink and are all in need of Jesus. Then Jesus says this, this is amazing. He says, oh foolish man, slow in heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? The beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Remember, Jesus is on this walk for seven miles. In the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Jesus himself is preaching to these two for seven miles. Walking. I can drive seven miles and I can give you a message in the car. They are walking for seven miles. And Jesus is preaching. You want to talk about a long message, folks. That's Jesus preaching on a walk for seven miles. And what's he preaching about? Jesus. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, he's speaking about Jesus for a seven-mile walk. Now, this is incredible. It gets dark. These two disciples are like, man, come to our house where we've arrived at the village. Don't go out in the night. Come eat with us. And then this happens. This is incredible. Verse 30. And we had when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it. He began to give it to them. Could you imagine Jesus now handing them bread? And the Bible says this, verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. I can imagine one of the disciples when Jesus is handing them bread. Dude, check out his hand. <laughs> the brother's got a hole in his hand. Dude, no. Dude, just look. Dude, dude, look at his hand. I could imagine when they see his hands. And their eyes are open and they recognize, it's Jesus. It's the Christ. This is re You are exactly who you said you are. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the one who gives us the living hope. It is you. And I could imagine for seven miles, man, they could have asked him anything. And now that they recognize that he is Jesus, that he came back from the grave, that he is alive, that he is the Messiah. He's exactly who he said he was. I could imagine that they've got just overwhelmed with their hope returning and Come, and I could imagine them having so many questions and wanting to celebrate with Jesus. And then this is what Jesus did. He vanished from their sight. <laughs> I mean, like, what? Come on. I mean, we got so much to talk about. Poof, gone. Like, man, we had seven miles with him. What is, dude, what is wrong with you? How could you not see his hands before this, right? I mean, the blame game goes on. Like, how do you not see this? But folks, I believe that they didn't recognize him at first because they left their hope behind. And you see this again in John 20. You've got Mary Magdalene who knew Jesus, cared for Jesus, served Jesus, was a part of that whole woman group that followed them place to place to serve their needs. Incredible. Had such a relationship with Jesus. Knew him. And here she goes back to the tomb and she is in an absolute place of being hopeless and lost. Because she believes Jesus is dead. And this is after the open tomb. And this is after the resurrection. And here she's just at the tomb and she is weeping. And this man walks up to her who was Jesus. And she didn't recognize that he was Jesus. Why are you weeping? The Bible says, Mary believing that he was the gardener. From Jesus to gardener. You know where Jesus is? Did you take his body? Because if you took his body, I'll go and I'll get it. 
If you're the one who opened the tomb, man, I'll, if you took his body, I'll go get it. I'll bring it back. If Jesus is right next to her and she doesn't recognize that it's Jesus because she was in a place of sorrow and she was in a place of grief and she was in a place of, of her hope being lost and she was in a place going, it wasn't supposed to be this way. This wasn't the way it was supposed to turn out. And Jesus just simply says, could you imagine this scene? Mary. Instantly, Mary knows. I mean, he's already spoke to her. And he speaks her name. And Mary recognizes that it's Jesus. Could you imagine the flood of hope that instantly returns? It is you. It's Rabbi teacher. She reaches out, and I could just see her on her face and tears, just grabbing for the feet of Christ in amazement that it's true. The tomb is empty. You are alive. You are resurrected. You are everything that you said you were. I could imagine a hope that returned. Folks, I think there are so many times in our lives that we don't see Jesus right in front of us because we have left our hope somewhere else. Because we walk in a place of grief, we walk in a place of sorrow, we walk in a way that we actually would say, this is not the way I thought it would be. I had a different plan. This is not the way it was supposed to go. So many times when we allow that to come in, we can leave our hope behind. It can blind us from all the amazing things that Jesus is doing in our lives. Let's just bow our heads, please. Psalm 39, 7 says, where do I go from here? What do I look for? What am I waiting for? And he answers his own question. For my hope is in you. Some of you may be here this morning and saying, where do I go from here? Because I'm walking in a place right now, and it wasn't the way it was supposed to be. I'm walking in a way in my life right now, and I just, this wasn't the way I saw it happening, my life. So many times we leave our hope behind. And we take our eyes off Jesus. We don't see what's so right in front of us because the Bible says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says I will go before you and I will go behind you and I will hold your righteous right hand. That's what the Bible says. So many times we don't see him right there. Because we've left our hope someplace else. I'm asking you to come back to this place this morning. In Psalm 39.7, what am I looking for? I know where my hope should be. For my hope is in you. For my hope is in you. If you're in this place this morning. And you've never come to the truth of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you this morning, please. Understand that God loved you with such an incredible love and loves you the same always. Unchanging love for you. That all the work has been done for your salvation. All the work has been accomplished. Our responsibility has come to a place to recognize that we are separate from God because of our sin. And to repent and turn from our sin. To recognize that Jesus Christ died for me. Something I could never do for myself. Jesus Christ paid the price for me. For my sin. We sung a song called, I am redeemed. And the word redeemed means I have been bought back. I am paid for a price that I couldn't pay. And Jesus paid that price for me. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, that you, that you would confess, that means make an agreement. Jesus, you are divine. You are Lord. You are all authority. And I put myself under you. You are my king. That's what Lord means. It's a surrender deal. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's what today's all about then you shall be saved. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. 
That's the promise that we have for those who believe in Jesus. Man, if you're in this place and you're like, man, I really need Jesus, I'm just asking that you would, in your heart, that you would just really cry out to Him. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. And I am separate from you because of my sin. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for giving your life for my life. Jesus, I do believe that you are alive and that, God, you raised your son from the dead, conquering death, conquering hell and sin, conquering Satan, and giving me the victory. I believe that. I surrender my life to you right now. Maybe for those who are in this place this morning that you have left your hope behind. <laughs> and you are here this morning going, man, that is so me. This is not the way it's supposed to be for me. I had a completely different plan. But what do I wait, man? What am I looking for? That you would put your hope in the Lord this morning. You would come back to a place, folks, please come back to a place to renew and refresh your hope in Him. And hope means a confident expectation, anticipation of what is good. As Brennan sings this last song, I'm just asking that in the moment you would just come to a place to know that Christ has overcome. Christ has overcome. And let our hope would return to a place that we would walk in a place as the two disciples did, as Mary did, when our eyes are open to know that Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. He's right there with us all the time. He's with us. And that we would return to a place to know. God, you love me and you are faithful. Even when I have not been faithful, you are faithful forever. And I put my trust in that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.